Friends, words fail me to adequately express my personal appreciation as well as the appreciation of my family for all that has been done for us throughout this week and particularly today. And I just don't know how to say it any other way than just to tell you very sincerely that we are very, very thankful. And this will be a day that will long be remembered by us all. And I want to say to Brother Boren and to the eldership here and to Brother Miller and to each of you personally that we do appreciate the encouragement that you have given to us. And I pray that God will give us many more days to serve in his kingdom. I pray every night in our family devotions that God will give us yet many days to serve him in the church, the church that we love. But the church is composed of you. And so may that indicate to you the love that we have in our hearts and our desire to yet spend many days in his kingdom in the proclamation of truth. A people on their way home. By way of introduction, I want to note three things. First, this particular caption indicates that we are the people of God. We are the people of God first by creation. In the book of Psalms, we read in chapter 100 and verse 3, Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us. That's creation. And we are his people and the sheep of his pasture. His people by creation. Then we are the people of God by regeneration. By recreation. And thus in the first Corinthian letter and in chapter 6 we read, Ye are not your own, for ye have been bought with a price, a purchased people. Wherefore glorify God in your body. That's a purposed people. I purpose to glorify God. Ye glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's spelled in the possessive. And therefore, not only a purchased people, not only a purposed people, but a possessed people as well. First, we are God's people by creation and by recreation. Secondly, the caption of our study indicates that we are not only the people of God, but we are the people of God on our way. Life is oftentimes described in the Bible as a journey. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth unto destruction. And many there be that go in thereat. But straight is the gate and narrow is the way. Life is a journey, and few there be that find it. Add to that that the inspired text often emphasizes that this journey, we're on our way is a very brief experience. And that's why we read in Job 14, beginning with one, man that is born of woman is a few days and full of trouble. And then add to that, that this uh, journey that we're now taking, indeed brief as it is, will have come to a close by reason of death. And thus we read in the book of Job 5 and 26, Thou shalt come to thy grave in a full age, like as a shock of corn cometh in its season. But then when I turn back to the caption, I see thirdly, that not only are we the people of God, the people of God on our way, but we are the people of God on our way home. In the book of Ecclesiastes, and in chapter 12 and in verse 5, the wise man is giving us a very graphic description of um, the elderly, our golden years. And in the midst of that very graphic description, he says, 
Also when they shall be afraid of that which is high, and fear shall be in the way, and the almond tree shall flourish, and the grasshopper shall be a burden, and desire shall fail, because man goeth to his long home, and the mourners go about the streets. Notice particularly that phrase, because man goeth to his long home. In this life we are but wayfaring strangers. We are but pilgrims passing through. As we read the book of Hebrews chapter 11 and verses 13 through 16. And thus tonight the assigned topic. A people on their way home. I would like to begin now by way of the body of the content. By observing first of all that I have a home. And that home is called heaven. May I affirm that in the following bases. In the first place, the Bible teaches us that there is a place called heaven. In the book of 1 Kings chapter 8 and verse 46, at the dedicatory service of the temple, we will remember that Solomon said, The heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain thee, O Lord, much less this house I have built for thee. Again, David would say in the book of Psalms, chapter 73 and in verse 25, Whom have I in heaven but thee alone? In 1 Peter 3, 22, we read, Who Christ is gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God. Philippians 3 and verse 20 says, For our citizenship is in heaven, from whence we look also for our Lord Jesus Christ. And then I read in the book of John, chapter 14, and in verses 1 through 6, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. And all of that being predicated upon this uh, aforementioned um, uh, promise. In my Father's house are many mansions. And the Amplified Translation renders that, In my Father's house are many homes. Yes, I have a home, and that home is heaven. And we thus affirm because the Bible says there is such a place. Secondly, redemption implies that there is a heaven. Without heaven, redemption largely loses its design and significance. And that's why, friends, in the Protestant world, where there are so many doubts, if not outright denial about the great hereafter, that there is no longer any measured uh, emphasis in the field of evangelization, in the redemption of man, in the salvation of the soul, but rather there is a majoring on the social issues, that is, matters that pertain to the present time. Add to that thirdly, that we say that we have a home, and that home is heaven because hell suggests it. In the book of Matthew chapter 25 and in verse 46 we read, And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life everlasting. Notice that study in contrast. Again in the book of John chapter 5, 28 and 29, you would recall that the text says, Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice, and come forth, they that have done good to the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil to the resurrection of damnation. So that there is a hell to shun, there is a heaven one day to experience. I have a home, and that home is heaven. And we thus affirm because the Bible states that such is the case. Secondly, redemption implies it, and hell suggests it. But secondly tonight, I have a home. And that home is called heaven. And I am going there. I believe that there is a great need for assurance in our given day and time. Nothing uncommon today for statements of doubt and despair to be made such as, 
I am not really sure that I am going to heaven. Yea, if I were to die right now, indeed, I am not really sure. Others have been heard to say I would give anything in the world to really know that I would be saved in eternity. Now, in that context of our present society, it is so indeed wonderful to know that we can have assurance. In 1 John 2 and 3 we read that hereby we do know that we know him because we keep his commandments. 1 John 5 and 13 reads, These things have I written unto you who believe in the name of uh, the Lord Jesus Christ that you may know you have eternal life and this life is in his Son. So not only can we know that we have salvation from our past and alien sins, the first quoted text, 1 John 3 and verse 2, but we know according to 1 John chapter 5 and verse 13 that we can also have assurance from the standpoint of being heaven bound. When I moved to Neosho, Missouri back a number of years ago in the early 50s, the first meeting that was conducted after our move was conducted by the late Rue Porter. He was affectionately known by all who knew him as Uncle Rue. He made his home in the Osho, but he spent his life in the conducting of gospel meetings. Well, when that meeting was in progress, he came to the meeting house one night, and prior to the services, I said to him, I said, well, Brother Porter, I said, uh, how are you tonight? And he said, oh, he said, I have been sick. I have been sick all day. I said, do you feel like preaching? And he said, oh, yes. He said, I'm going to preach. And I still remember his sermon. He preached on the two covenants. And after the uh, service had been dismissed and people had fairly well filed out of the meeting house, I said, Brother Porter, how are you feeling? He said, Brother Winkler, I'm sick. One of our members was a medical doctor, and I said to him, I said, Tom, he's on duty. I said, let's go, to, let's go to the hospital. He said, I'm going to let you take me. And I took Brother Porter down to the hospital, and Dr. Walkup said to him, he said, Wendell, he said, we're all brethren. He said, nobody here tonight. He said, come on in. Come on in the examining room with us. And I went in. And he listened to Brother Porter so carefully. And he had Brother Porter to dismiss himself out of the room. And while he was out, the doctor described to me his heartbeat. And he said, Wendell, he said, that beat ordinarily precedes a thrombosis. Not that if you have the beat, you'll have a thrombosis. But he said, ordinarily, that's the beat that precedes it. Well, it was very frightening to me. Brother Porter came back in, and the doctor had him to be seated upon the examining table. And he took a stool beneath him. And he talked at random for ever so long. Finally, Brother Porter, who then was well up in years, became a little impatient. And he turned to the doctor and he said, What's the verdict? He said, You could tell me I would drop dead in 15 minutes and I would never bat an eye, for I've been preparing for it too long. That's assurance. I have a home. It's called heaven. And I know I'm going there. But now what are the grounds of such assurance? It's certainly not meritorious goodness. As we're told in the book of Ephesians chapter 2, 8 through 10 and Titus chapter 3, verses 3 through 7. But the ground of the assurance of which we speak tonight is first the grace of God. Therefore being justified by grace, reads Titus chapter 3 and verse 7. And secondly, the cleansing power of the blood of Christ, as Brother Gomer quoted a moment ago, Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 7. And add to that the declaration of truth found in Holy Scripture. Remember, these things have I written that you may know ye have eternal life. So based upon the grace of God, based upon the cleansing efficacy of the blood of Christ, based upon the scriptures and the affirmation found therein, we can then voice the assurance that indwells our hearts. I have a home 
called heaven. And I know when I die, I'm going there. But thirdly tonight, when I get to my home, I will only spend one day. But it will last forever. And it will last forever. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it. And the Lamb is the light thereof. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it. And the kings are there to bring their glory and honor into it. And the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day. For there is no night there. Reads Revelation 22, 20, 21, 23 through 25. Additionally, chapter 22 and 5 uh, reads, And there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Yes, I will only spend one day there, but it will last forever. Multiplied numbers are the passages that affirm the eternality of the home of the soul. But how long is that? Friends, you cannot describe the indescribable. You cannot comprehend the incomprehensible. You cannot measure the measureless. And thus it is impossible for our finite minds to comprehend the infinite. Brother T.B. Larimore used to, in an effort to somehow or another, in some microscopic way, to get across the emphasis of the moment, thus say, count every grain of sand that has ever been on all the seashores, of all the oceans of the earth and all the grains of sand that have ever been in all the riverbeds and all the creek beds and then get that total. And then he said, go and count every leaf that has ever grown on every tree that God ever made and multiply the two figures together. And then when he said, when you get the total then, Count every blade of every little bit of grass that's grown on the earth since the first day of creation. And then multiply that by your previous sum. And he said, when you get through spending that many years in eternity, it will still be in its inception. Spend 10 million years, 10 billion years out there in the great span known as eternity. And when that much time will have transpired, you're still at the starting point. When you come to think of eternity, I, I know no way to say it except to say it this way. You never leave the starting point. In no time after those billions of years will have transpired, are you any closer to come into the cessation of that marvelous experience of being at home with God? Ladies and gentlemen, I have a home. It is called heaven. Add to that, I know when I die, I'm going home. And then additionally add to that, I know when I get home, I'll only spend one day. But it will last forever. But then, may I suggest in the fourth place tonight, that when I get to my long home, what will it be like there? May I begin tonight by suggesting to us 
that when I get home, I will be with my father. And that's home. In Matthew 6 and 9 we read, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. The Revelation letter reads, And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them. And they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. I was born and reared in Port Arthur, Texas. I recall with what joy our family, what joy we experienced when we entered into a little humble house at 27, 14, 15th Street. It had one little small bath, two extremely small bedrooms, and a kitchen, and a little small living room. And that's where Paul and I were reared. I still occasionally go back to Port Arthur. And I make trip after trip, and I never even go to 27. 14, 15th Street. It don't hold any attachment to me anymore. And you know why? Because my parents, my father, is no longer there. But if my mother and father were living, and my father was in that house, I would far more frequently go back to Port Arthur. And I would go to the 2700 block of 15th Street. Why the difference? The presence of the Father always makes a difference. When the Fort Worth Christian College lectures were being conducted, we had one year as our theme, the last days. The lectureship committee stated that we wanted Brother Gus Nichols to discuss the subject of heaven. So I called Brother Nichols on the telephone and gave him the invitation to come, and he certainly came to be with us, as many of you will recall, having even been there that night. In the conversation we had over the phone, I said, Now, Brother Nichols, what we have in mind is this. When you discuss heaven, the home of the soul, which will be the last sermon of the lecture program, we want you to take us there. We want you to take us to the city of God. And I can still hear his response. He said, I will do my best. Well, we had emphasized the lecture program and we had built up to a climax. The gymnasium was full. We had them all up in the bleachers. And the time came for Brother Nichols to preach on heaven. And he said, I want to go to heaven because that's where God is. And for some 45 minutes, he dealt with, I want to go to heaven because that is where God is. And for no more than three or four minutes did he talk about the street of gold and the walls of Jasper. And I must tell you that when he finished, I somewhat was disappointed. But in the intervening years, oh, how I have changed my concept. You see, what is home without the Father? And that was where the emphasis should have been. What will it be like to be home? It will be to be with the Father. Add to that, what will it be like to be there? It will mean that I will see Jesus, my elder brother. And I've always had a little difficulty with that, my elder brother. I don't, that's just me. Somehow or another, there is a sense of condescension there. 
that doesn't all together, somehow or another, just uh, have a comfortable place in my heart. But I know the Lord understands tonight, and I'm trying to emphasize home. And in the sense that we are heirs of God, a joint heirs with Christ. Do I use that term? And so what will it be like to be at home? It will mean that I will see Jesus, my elder brother. You see, John 6 and 33 says he came down from heaven. Mark 16 and 19 says when he gave the commission that he ascended up to heaven. And then I read in 1 Peter 3, 22, who is in heaven at the right hand of God. Then I read in the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and 16 that the Lord himself shall descend from heaven. Now watch the point. He came from heaven, went to heaven, is in heaven, and will come from heaven. Heaven and the Lord are inseparably attached. A young believer asked an aged saint near Jordan's brink if he could come and read the Bible. And upon arriving, he said, May I read to you the sweetest verse in the Bible? And she said, Yes. And he began to read. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God. Believe also in me. For in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And stopped. Upon stopping, the agent one said, No, that's not the sweetest verse. Read on. And thus he continued. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there ye may be also. And then she said, that's the sweetest verse. For you see, she said, it is not the mansions, but it is he himself that I want. Fanny J. Crosby, as you know, was blind. She once said, if I, were to st at the stand, if I were to stand at the beginning of my life with the privilege of making a single request of God, I think it would be this. My Father, let me walk through the earth in physical darkness. She then added, you have looked into many a face, some of them touched with beauty, some of them alighted with joy. But the first face I shall see is the face of Christ. I am not dealing with the eternal destiny of Mrs. Crosby at all. But the thought of seeing the face of our Lord fails us with ecstasy beyond possibility of expression. And thus what a joy to see. And I shall see him face to face. And I will sing, saved by grace. I've often thought I would love to have been a member of the apostleship. To have been one of the selected 12. But that was not my privilege. I would far rather have been a member of that inner circle of Peter, James, and John and to have been there upon the Mount of Transfiguration and to have seen the Lord transfigured and to have heard the commending voice of the Father. I would love to have been with the Lord in the shadows of Gethsemane. But that wasn't mine to know. And I would love to have been Lazarus and lived in Bethany and have had the Lord to have knocked at my door frequently and to have been an overnight guest. But that was not my privilege. But I will one day have the privilege of being with my Lord 
in the home of the soul. Add to that third. What will it be like to be home? It means that I will be able to associate with my redeemed brethren. That's home. With my redeemed brethren, yea, of all ages. I love the sentiment expressed in Matthew 8 and verse 11. But I say unto you, many shall come from the east and from the west, and shall sit down with Abraham and with Isaac and with Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. How sweet and how heavenly is the fellowship such as we have experienced together this very week. You know, during times like this, we stay up many times past midnight, conversing with those of like precious faith. And how wonderful is that period of association. But I'm, oh, friends, these matters simply pale in a letter in significance. When we began to think about what it will be like to be with the redeemed, our redeemed brethren of all ages in the home of the soul and to be able to sit down with Abraham and to be able to discuss Moriah and to be able to sit down with John and to discuss uh, the Isle of Patmos and to be able to sit down and discuss with Elijah, Mount Pisgah, or rather Mount Carmel, and to sit down and discuss with Moses, Mount Pisgah, and to be able to sit down and discuss with Polycarp what it was like to be with the lions. Yea, to associate with my redeemed brethren of all ages. But what will it be like to be home? May I suggest additionally that I will then be with my loved ones. That's home. I will be with my loved ones again. You see, Christians never see one another for the last time. There will be a glad reunion. Did not the uh, psalmist David say in the book of 2 Samuel 12 and verse 23, he said, I shall go to him, speaking of his infant child, who had just died. But he said, he shall not return unto me. David had the assurance in his heart that one day there would be a reunion over there and that even with that little child who was born even in the process of his early hours, who died in his early hours. But he believed that there would be that reunion over there. And I cannot even imagine within my heart that he would have found any consolation at all. That if somehow or another he knew that his child was going to be over there in the glory world, but he was going to be lost somehow or another in an unidentified mass of spiritual beings. Now, what comfort would that have been? But surely that statement implies that he expected one day to go home to God, and when he got home, there would be his little infant child, and he would know that child over there. Isn't that what Paul implied in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and 13 when he said, for what is our hope and what is our joy are not even ye in the presence of our Lord and that at his coming. And so how marvelous and how wonderful is it, it is to think of those glad reunions over there. And like Brother Hardiman Nichols and Brother Borlin and Brother Ramsey who have dedicated the majority of their lives in the holding of meetings, I have spent countless hours, formerly in train depots, bus stations, and now in airports, and I have seen reunion after reunion. I was on a flight sometime back into Columbus, Ohio for a meeting, and Desert Storm had just come to a close. In fact, most of the men were still over there. Seated across the aisle from me was a young man on the identical row right across the aisle. And we began to converse. And he had been over in that region and was returning home. And he said, while I've been gone, he said, my first child has been born, and I've never seen him. All of a sudden, that began to permeate 
that entire aircraft. And when we pulled up to the door, everybody in that aircraft stood up and nobody stepped in the aisle. And in unison, I never expect to hear anything like that. In unison, that whole passenger group said, let him out. And nobody got an eye out. And that young man ran down that aisle. And when I stepped off that aircraft, I saw the balloons. And I saw the ribbons. And I saw that family. And I saw that wife embrace her husband. And I saw that father cradle his little child for the first time. And I thought, what a wonderful reunion. Oh, but my friends, to be able to step out on heaven's shore and to be able to experience the glad reunion of those great men of God, women of God, who have predeceased us, and to step out on the eternal shores and to warmly embrace mothers, fathers, brothers and sisters who have long before gone home to be with God. That's what it will be like to be home. It will mean a glad reunion. But what will it be like to be at home? It means that I will be at rest. Blessed are the dead that die in the Lord, yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors. Reads Revelation 14 and verse 13. And so the athlete longs for rest after an arduous workout. That weary traveler after a wearisome day longs for rest. The laborer longs for rest after a very toilsome day. The child of God longs for rest as he does not become weary in well-doing. But then what will it be like to be home? It will mean that I will never experience illness, pain, or affliction again. Friends, I used to live in Houston, and I would visit regularly the MD Anderson Cancer and Tumor Research Hospital. I will not be explicit with this, but there were two areas in that hospital that I had to discipline myself to visit. One of them was a pediatric ward. And the other was where they had malignancies from the neck region upward. And that's all I will say about that. But when I would leave those scenes, I would say to myself on the way back to my car, death is better than living in some cases. When I was preaching at the Glen Garden Church here in Fort Worth, we supported in New York Brother Darrell Collins. Many of you will remember his family. His mother and father were longtime members of the old Eastland congregation here in the city. Brother Darrell Collins' father, a faithful Christian, Brother Collins, became gravely ill. He had a malignancy of the brain. And the doctors had told the family that the last hours of his life would be of an excruciating pain that would be impossible to any way at all accommodate. And I would step off of that elevator and I would begin to head down that corridor and I could hear Brother Collins. And I would enter into that room. And Sister Collins would say, Daddy said, Brother Winkler is here said, can you please get quiet enough for him to say a little prayer? And he would just calm for a moment, and I would say a brief right back into that traumatic state he would go. And the last things that I could hear echoing in my ears as I would get back on that elevator would be those haunting groans of that man in the throes of dying with a brain cancer that the narcotic could not even reach who would want to live forever in a world like that? But when I get home, 
It means there will be no more illness, no more pain, and no more affliction. I know what pain is, but I know far more what emotional pain is. I know what it is to sit across the desk of a doctor and to somehow or another for him to communicate to you, you have a condition that is gravely serious. Not terminal, but gravely serious. I know what it is for that to be taken care of. Then I know what it is to have a reoccurrence of it. And then to have the assurance that at least it's all is well now. But I know what it is to live in apprehension as does Perry Coffin and some of these others in this audience. Between those three months and those six months intervals and the others gave now for the 12 month intervals. I know what emotional pain is. And I know what physical pain is. And I know what it is to look into the bedewed, teared cheeks of a wife and the hollow eyes of a family who have just got that news and who want to say, but don't know what to say something. I know what all of that is. But thank God that we have a home where there will be no such experiences again. Brother Jack Exum tells of his little son. When he was two, being stricken with polio, and he was destined for life to braces and crutches. Brother Exum said that he began to somehow or another to fabricate his own defense mechanism against the disease. And he said one of them was singing. And he would make up his own lyrics. And he said when he was five, he heard him singing one day while he was shaving. When I get to heaven, you know what I'm going to do. I'm going to run up the stairs, then run down the stairs. And Brother Exum told that story in East Texas. And Sister Joy Hagstrom was touched by it and sat down and wrote, One day I saw a crippled boy watch children playing ball. I had to blink the tears away and answer to his call. Hey, mister, if you got the time, would you sit down and talk I'd like to run and play with them, but I just can't walk. I'd like to chase that ball a mile or climb that hollow tree or swim in the swimming hole or take a hike, you see. Well, one day I'll do those things without a thought of care. Mister, when I get to heaven, there ain't no cripples there. I'm going swimming in the river and climb that hollow tree and hike along the golden streets throughout eternity. But now, I'll just watch the children as they run and jump and play and know that I'll be like them someday. There are no hospitals and clinics and sanitariums on the street of gold. And lastly tonight, may I observe, what will it be like to be home? It means I will never experience a separation again or a death. I was in San Diego in a meeting a number of years ago, and someone said, Brother Winkler, look over there. And I looked, and they said, from right there, the majority of the foot soldiers now fighting in Vietnam leave. And I thought how many times had those sandy shores been bathed in the tears of sweethearts and mothers and fathers and sons and daughters and wives. I thought, oh, as they said goodbye to their dearest on earth. When I preached here, as Brother Boren has done, I stood on numbers of occasions right here. And I have seen families melt like they could be poured into this concrete floor as they would say goodbye to the dearest upon earth to them. When I was at Faulkner, I would see those families come and bring their children, freshmen, first time they've ever been away from home, bedroom to be empty for the first time in 18 years. And they would unload them and get them all situated in their dorms, and they would just 
linger around. They just some another couldn't leave. And finally, the time would come when the necessity was upon them and they'd say, we just must leave. And I would see those sons hug their fathers and I'd see those daughters hug their mothers and they would say goodbye. And they would go out to Interstate 85 and head toward home. There's nothing pleasant about that. There was nothing pleasant about San Diego and there's nothing pleasant about that memorial service. I don't know any separation in life is good save the one from sin. But I can tell you over there, there will never be a separation. There are no goodbyes, adieus, or I'll be seeing yous in heaven. But what about that separation by death? There will never be death in heaven. I've been acquainted with death ever since I was a very small child. The first recollection I have of death is in a little small country meeting house out at West Boone Prairie in Franklin, Texas, where the J.P. Sewell preached in his first gospel meeting in one of the oldest churches of Christ in the state of Texas. Where my father stood up in those very humble surroundings and preached the funeral of my grandmother, Johnson. The family, most of them coming from Lawrenceburg, Tennessee to Robinson County in covered wagon. But I remember when my grandmother Johnson died and my daddy preached her funeral. I recall the first funerals I ever preached. I had never preached a funeral in my life and I preached two the same day. One of them a little child killed at a wreck at a railroad. And the other one, a child stillborn. And then I recall when death invaded our own immediate family. When the phone came and my mother had slipped out of this world into the other, dying in St. Petersburg, Florida. Then when my daddy came to see us and he could not walk across the floor unless he gasped for air. And I said, Daddy, you've got to go see a doctor while you're here. We had him to see Dr. Carr and surgery was prescribed. They found him totally engulfed. My daddy was taken into the intensive care and he begged, he begged us to be able to leave. And he said, Son, if you don't get me out of here, I'll die. And that went on for about 48 hours, and finally we said, Dr. Carr, he is losing his, he's losing his rationality. He believes that there are forebodings in there. Can we possibly move him out? He said, we're going to move him out. He said, he shouldn't be moved, but we're going to move him into a private room. And I never will forget with what inexpressible delight with all that apparatus that we moved him out of intensive care and we moved him into a private room. He wasn't there but eight hours until he became so gravely ill that we moved him back into intensive care. And I was about to leave to go to preach over at the Glen Garden Church when Dr. Wise, one of the elders of the South Side, called and said, uh, Brother Winkler, you and your brother said, uh, it's going to be better if you don't leave the hospital. And in just a little while, the announcement came that my father had passed out into eternity. I preached the funeral of my grandmother. I preached the funeral of my mother and I preached the funeral of my father. I have been acquainted with death. It's the enemy of man. It's the last one to ever be conquered. And our Lord will have come in by reason of the power of the resurrection. Death will be no more. It will then be in the city of God when we go home. That it will never be ours thus to experience it again. Suppose I could say to you tonight, I know a place where men are never sick. Everybody would want to go there. Suppose I could say, I know a place where men never weep. Everybody would want to go there. Suppose I could say, I know a place where men never die. Everybody would want to go there. Why? To experience only one blessing. But heaven has them all. 
And that's why there is no burden that is too heavy. That's why there is no sacrifice that is too great. That's why there is no price to be paid that is too great. And that's why there is no challenge that's too measurable not to be met for us to one day to enter into the city of God. For throughout those ceaseless ages, encased in the walls of Jasper, after having entered through those gates of pearl, as we walk that street of gold, we shall be heard to say time and time again, as the Queen of Sheba said, the half has never yet been told. His people, his people not by merit, but by unspeakable grace and through obedient faith, his people, both now and forever, and thus may we join with every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and exclaim blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne under the Lamb forever and forever. And if you're present tonight and not ready for that city, will you not this night become a baptized penitent believer as was the case in Acts 2 or come back home through restoration to your duty if you are indeed no longer therein? Even now, as together, we now stand and we sing.